Okay. Hello. Welcome back, everybody. Oh, now we're getting into the good stuff, right? We did the Great Depression. Franklin Roosevelt's the president. And we left off in 1937 with that very rough year he had with the three different crises. He had a big political fight with the Supreme Court that blew up in his face. Although I did mention that he does win eventually. Uh, he's able to replace every single Supreme Court justice by 1945, by the time of his death, or eight of the nine, I believe. Um, but in 1937, he ran right into a brick wall with that court packing plan. And then the Congress started to say no to him quite a bit. Uh, same year, the stock market collapsed again, a, a recession within a depression. Isn't that wonderful? And this time he couldn't blame it on Herbert Hoover. You know, um, it's very interesting um, how politics works with economics. You guys probably know when the economy's good, the party in power does very well, reaps the benefits, the rewards. But when the economy's bad, everybody blames the person in charge in many ways. Uh, probably uh, Donald Trump lost the election because the bad economy coupled with the pandemic. Now we can ask, is that fair? You have to look at what a president can actually do to, to improve things. That's beside the point. Um, the point is that generally speaking, when an economy is bad, they throw the bum out, right? And I'm not calling the president a bum, but what I'm saying is that's the, the ethos, the attitude of most Americans. Like in 1932, get Herbert Hoover out of there, let's try something new. And in 1936, things did seem better. Uh, FDR won on a landslide, but in 37, they got worse. It's kind of like Obama in 08 wins because the Republican party was in power, the economy collapsed. In 2012, the economy wasn't great, but the trajectory was on the upward shot. So most Americans said, well, things are getting better. So they'll forgive a seven or 8% unemployment rate if it was 15 the previous cycle, right? So Roosevelt was not doing well in 1937. Everybody blamed him for this new recession and rightly so. Um, and then finally, this international crisis with Japan, not as much with Germany. Americans, although to, did not like the fascist regime in Germany or Italy, most people felt it didn't affect us or our interests. Um, Japan was a direct threat to American interests because we have the Philippines and Guam in uh, the Far East. Uh, and that was directly threatened by Japanese aggression marching into China that year. So the Great War, World War II really makes modern America in many, 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 many ways unforeseen things. I'll give you just one example. This is kind of crazy, but our entire healthcare system today is a byproduct of World War II. Um, in the middle of the war, the U.S. government had tremendous authority over everything, and uh, one of the things they had control over was wage and price controls to combat inflation. Americans were told to plant victory gardens in their backyards, shortages of, you know, fruits, vegetables, dairy products, you know, meat, all kinds of stuff like that. And so Americans were told, if you want more than, you know, three tomatoes a week, you're going to have to plant some in your backyard. If you want more than, you know, a can of corn a week, you're going to have to plant some in your backyard. And Americans did these things and, you know, we're sort of self-reliant, but also inter interdependent at the same time. People had to ration gasoline, all that kind of stuff. Um, when the government spends a ton of money, inflation spirals upwards. People buy more, there's shortages of things, and, and unions go on strike. So they say, you know, my workers can't keep up with the price of inflation. We need a raise. They get the raise, they go out and buy more stuff. It feeds the shortage, inflation goes up even more. So government often will come in and say, literally to the bosses, you cannot give any raises to your employees. And people that sell things, you cannot raise the price of it. We have to tamp down inflation. Well, one of the things employers did, because if you're an employer and it's full employment in 1944, it was 1.2% unemployment. Anyone with a pulse could get a job, basically. Far cry from 10 years before in the Great Depression. So what do you offer your workers? Why would you say, come work for me if you can't give them any better raise than the other guy down the street? This happens in a lot of economies where they have complete wage controls and price controls. It, by the way, this is how it used to be in America with airlines. like. Every single airline had the identical price from airport to airport. A ticket from LAX to JFK in New York cost X, whatever it was, for decades from the 30s through the 70s. So why would you ever choose Pan Am versus TWA, right? If they're identical in price, the service, right? They'll give you more leg room, better 
meals, right? More to drink, et cetera. One thing that they very shamelessly did is they both tried to hire the most attractive young women to be stewardesses so businessmen could kind of flirt with them on their flights, you know, come fly TWA because you know, our stewardesses are even more attractive. Go watch that Leo DiCaprio movie, um, Catch Me If You Can, and you'll see what air travel was like in the 60s. Um, when you can't give your employees a raise, you attract them to come work for you with other things like healthcare. Right. But people want to know, why is it only in America that we have an employer based system where your boss basically covers you? That's a little weird. It's because of that, because there was no national government health service before World War II and people started to get wealthier, move into the middle class. They wanted health care and the boss couldn't give them money to go buy the insurance. So the boss just said, all right, you get insurance. And then after World War II, other businesses wanted to compete with that model. And so we're left over with this weird after effect of World War II. And here we are almost 80 years later, and we still have that system. That's just one example. Women going into the workplace, you know, fueling the feminist movement. That was another side effect. Uh, our agricultural uh, markets today are largely subsidized based on that. Our tax-based system is largely based on the World War II model. And it goes on and on and on. So this is a very famous picture. Um, it's interesting how this picture is aged, you know, when uh, 18 years ago, when I started teaching in 2003, you would just sort of show the picture and say, you know, uh, this is what's known as VJ Day, Victory Over Japan, uh, September the 2nd, 1945. Remember, Germany surrenders first in May on May the 8th, but Japan keeps fighting for another four months. So this is a sailor who was so excited that day. He went up and down um, Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, um, literally just grabbing any woman he could find and kissing them. Um, it's been, of course, uh, in the Me Too movement, um, very much maligned as an act of uh, sexual assault. I won't comment on it one way or another, but nonetheless, the picture is very iconic. Um, not putting any value judgment or anything like that, but this was a huge, uh, before there were viral videos and images, this picture went viral, basically, the old fashioned way, just through newspapers and things like that. But it's also uh, very reflective of the time. I mean, you can't even really describe how happy and exhausted people were in September of 45. You know, we've kind of bought into this myth that the US had this high morale and we would have fought forever. The US was more comfortable than any other country during World War II. We actually profited, benefited, did much better than any other country that went to war. But people were exhausted, make no mistake. By the summer of 1945, people were just fed up with the war. Lots of newspapers were saying, why don't we just cut a deal with Japan and just get the heck out? I don't want my boy to be the last person to die for a war that doesn't make sense. We've sort of papered over that. Um, there was high morale in 42 and 43 and, early, and definitely in 44, but by the time the Germans surrendered, Americans were just exhausted. There was even talk of mutinies aboard uh, US vessels uh, in the Navy, like literally men just saying, we refuse to fight, let's just go back home. Luckily, it didn't come to that. But imagine, you know, this war has been dragging on for, for six years for the world, four years for the US, and, and you're scheduled to go fight and invade Japan. November of 45 was the scheduled invasion where it was projected possibly a million Americans could die in that invasion. And when Japan finally surrendered after the second atomic bomb, people were so thrilled and excited and just exhausted that it was over. We've never really experienced anything like that in our own lives. So we are going to completely skip over the first slide. I used to do this where I would spend maybe 30 minutes going over the rise of the Nazi party and why fascism appealed to many Germans. Unfortunately, <clears throat> this is a US history class. We don't really need to get into those details, although they're very interesting and fascinating. All you really need to know is that Hitler was a really bad guy. And I think we're all on board with that. I don't think I have to you know, push you too hard to that conclusion. Whereas World War I is a very complicated war, British were you know, not being fair to the Germans and, and their African markets and the French likewise were being very mean to them and Germany likewise was being an aggressor and fault can be you know, diffused in a lot of different areas. Not in World War II, this is, everybody bent over backwards to be nice to Herr Hitler and he was not nice back. He violated you know, agreement after agreement, did horrible, horrible things, both, you know, within Germany and to his neighbors. And finally, this exploded in September of 39. Now, Americans, as I said, are not completely unmoved by this. They're watching the news safely from our own hemisphere. Um, 
in public opinion polls, overwhelmingly, something like 85% of Americans say, we don't like Germany and Italy. We want France and Britain to win this war, but we just don't want to fight it. It's got nothing to do with us. We were hardened from our experience in World War I. And so sort of this um, shell of mythology had formed to convince Americans that we were tricked into the First World War. The British tricked us and used us to save their empire, and it was all for nothing, and we're not going to get tricked again. So we were even more determined this time to stay out. Although our public sentiments very much with the Allies, but we're not even selling them really anything at the beginning of the war. Where is much more important to our involvement in World War II is what's going on in the Far East, what's going on with Japan. So let's talk about Japan real quick. You know, it's very interesting. My grandmother, she passed away in July of 2019. She was 95 years old. And uh, I remember her having a conversation with me once where she lived through World War II. Yet she was never really adequately explained why the Japanese attacked us on December the 7th, 1941. Most Americans did not know the Japanese were, you know, had designs on, on domination in the Far East that that was gonna lead us on a collision course with them um, and what led to it. They just sort of woke up one day and found out the Japanese had attacked us at, at Oahu and Pearl Harbor. Couldn't understand what, why on earth would they just attack us there for no reason? Well, it didn't really happen that way. And I had to explain to my grandma being the history nerd that I am that it, it was a bit more complex than that. So Japan. From the Japanese perspective, they had been encircled and threatened. If you look at the year 1900, basically white nations in Europe and you know the US, which is dominated by the white population there, had gone out all over the globe and dominated dark-skinned peoples in Asia, Africa, Latin America, and the Pacific. If you look at, at Asia, there were only two or three countries that had not been colonized at this time. China had been colonized, the Philippines, right? China is here. Uh, Korea was dominated by uh, the Russians. China had been carved up by numerous powers, Indonesia by the Dutch, Indochina by the French, the British are in Burma and Hong Kong and Australia and New Zealand. The Americans are here in Pearl Harbor. The Russians are to the north. It seemed to the Japanese like they had been completely surrounded. They had got to the dinner table quite literally when the meal was three quarters finished. And they're looking around saying, hey, we're, we can sit at the table with the big boys. We're a very strong industrial imperial power as well, but there were no more colonies. The world had been carved up basically. And Japan felt very badly about that. They felt threatened because they're the last independent nation in Asia. Them and Thailand pretty much were the only ones that were at least somewhat independent. They felt encircled, they felt threatened. So in 1904, they picked a fight with the Tsar and they were able to wrestle away Korea. That's their first little toehold onto the mainland, uh, onto the Asian continent. Uh, and they treated Korea like a colony. They expropriated the land. They had colonists in Japan basically move to Korea to become landowners and business owners and things like that. But it wasn't enough. There wasn't enough rice and minerals and everything to feed uh, and I, I don't mean literally feed, but just to feed the economy of the Japanese. Like so many empires, you, you know, you expand more, you have more population to take care of, and then you have to expand even further. So in 1931, Japan invaded Manchuria, the northeastern part of China, which, you know, was somewhat independent before. Now it was not independent at all. They installed a puppet state there. They uh, controlled the new emperor of Manchuria. And they had coal and oil and railways there, and it was a lucrative colony, but again, it was not enough. It wasn't like the British who had India or the Americans who had all these Latin American you know, possessions and Pacific possessions. It, it wasn't even what the French had in Indochina. It was kind of a pitiful empire because they, like I said, they had industrialized kind of in a second wave 40 or 50 years behind the rest of these Western countries. They were very wealthy, the Japanese. Um, understand that Japan is one of the most resource poor countries on earth. Like if you were, to design by nature or God a country to be poor, it would be Japan. They have no mineral wealth. They have no oil whatsoever. All they have is forests. So they have wood and they have the oceans where they can fish. That's it. So how are they such a wealthy country? Well, they import pretty much worthless commodities like oil and then they turn them into plastic computer chips 
and electronics, and then they ship those out to the world. Same thing with automobiles. They import kind of very cheap raw materials, and through technology, they export Toyotas and Hondas and all the rest of it. So this is how they basically industrialized and lifted their country out of poverty. The US had technology and innovation, but all of the natural resources as well. Japan didn't have that. So now they're expanding to get that. In 1937, they invaded China itself. They felt it was safe by that time because the European colonial masters who controlled China were very distracted with Hitler in Europe. By 1937, Hitler had marched into uh, the Rhineland he was making threats towards Austria, which he would annex just a few months later in March of 38. He would then bully Czechoslovakia and annex it. And so everyone in Europe is rearming. They're saying this is a huge threat. Britain is furiously trying to build more ships, more battleships, dreadnoughts, submarines, you name it, to, to challenge this mounting threat. A draft is uh, formed in France so that they can have a larger army, the largest in the world. Little good it would do them, but they're preparing for it all. This actually got all these European countries out of the Great Depression and it got them prepared for the war. But they were totally distracted by events in Europe and they could not send their fleet to reinforce these countries in Asia. Japan just went wild on a rampage there and no one could stop them. The US was really the only country that could have done something and was, you know, uh, this presented a threat to us, yet we did nothing. We could have done something, we had the means and we weren't distracted by the European situation, yet still Roosevelt kind of pathetically just sort of thumped his chest and said, don't do that. And they did it anyway. Japan got kicked out of the League of Nations and they just said to heck with it. Why are we trying to be nice to all these other countries? We can be the dominant power in Asia. So they aligned themselves with Hitler and they decided to essentially launch this war. Now, um, where things will very much um, heat up uh, is during the so-called rape of Nanking, which you might've learned about last year in Mr. Mulvihill's class. It really is extraordinary because this is before any kind of you know, huge events are happening in Europe. The war hadn't broken out yet in Europe. There was a lot of bullying and blustering, but nothing had quite happened. This was kind of the first instance of modern war. There was a civil war raging in Spain and Guernica became the first city ever bombed from the skies, but uh, Nanking is gonna get it even worse. The Japanese Imperial Navy flew over Nanking and bombed and then the army went to shore and they just went on a rampage and they murdered probably 300,000 civilians. And I don't mean this was collateral damage from the bombing. I mean, soldiers went into the city and just intentionally killed people. They had an immunity from prosecution, they could commit whatever crimes they wanted. Thousands and thousands of young girls in Korea and China were kidnapped and forcibly brought back to Japan to be quote unquote comfort women, essentially forced to work in brothels for Japanese soldiers. Um, this is, these are atrocities kind of beyond comprehension. And in a way, the Japanese kind of got off lucky in World War II because Everyone is focused on how evil and awful the Nazis are, that almost any regime would have been, you know, paled by comparison. People forget the horrible things that the Japanese did in World War II. I mean, they, I, I can't even get into the awful stuff, but it's really, really bad. And in this situation, you can really see it because what the extraordinary thing, I am not making this up, folks. You will think this is a joke or, you know, I'm exaggerating. The historical records show that things were so bad and all these British photojournalists are there filming all of these atrocities. The Japanese didn't even try to hide what they were doing. They were trained that they were a race of supermen descended from gods and that the rest of these people in Asia were inferior and the Europeans were too, they thought. They kind of felt, where is it written that only white nations get to be imperial nations? Why not us too? Uh, and so they went into Asia and they dominated and did awful things. It got so bad Adolf Hitler saw some of these newsreels because he went to the movies, he was an avid film buff and was so concerned. He wasn't really appalled by this. You know, you couldn't really offend Hitler with violence, but he was trying to convince all of these Europeans that he was a nice guy in 1937. He was trying to convince the British and the French and the Soviets, hey, you don't have to worry about me. You know, the bigger threat is actually Joseph Stalin. I'm the nice guy that's gonna stand up to the communists. Uh, all I want is fair treatment for my people. The war hadn't broken out in Europe. So he was trying to calm people's fears about him. 
he actually gets on the phone and calls Emperor Hirohito and says, can you tone down the violence in Nanking because you're making me look bad. We're allies and everyone is just hopping mad angry at you and that's flowing back on me. How bad do you have to be where Hitler calls you and says, tone down the violence? It's pretty awful, but the Japanese just went on a total rampage in China and uh, no one really did anything other than Roosevelt kind of pathetically complaining, but there was not much he could do. No one was going to declare war on the Japanese. Nobody wanted to go to a war. Uh, so most people just said, you know, sit it out, ignore it. The situation would change further in 1940 with the fall of France. France surrenders to Germany in June of 1940. They only stayed in the war four weeks, and then they cut a deal for a somewhat mild occupation, mild compared with what happened in Eastern Europe. And uh, the Japanese took advantage of this, right? With Holland and Belgium and France surrendering in the spring of 1940, Japan said, oh, there is no France to worry about anymore. I could just swoop in from China into Indochina. And so they did. In July of 1941, they extended this imperial invasion from Korea to Manchuria to China, now down into Indochina. This would send off alarm bells in Washington, DC, because here is our imperial possession, the Philippines, which the Japanese have now nearly surrounded. If they had moved in, in, into Indonesia, it would have been surrounded on three sides and totally indefensible. And there was big fears that that was going to happen because the Dutch had controlled Indonesia, they had surrendered to the Germans, no one would fortify their navy, anyone could easily go in and take it very easily. And we wanted to make sure to avoid that. In some ways, people have criticized Roosevelt because what he did was escalate the situation. Um, what he did in July of 1941 was he cut off all oil sales to the Japanese. Amazingly, despite all this tension, the US every day was sending oil tankers from Long Beach, California to cross the Pacific to sell to the Japanese, which then put that oil into their uh, dive bombers and, and, uh, and submarines and everything else to go on you know, this military conquest campaign throughout Asia. They had no oil of their own, not in Korea, not in Manchuria, not in the Japanese islands, not in China, not in Indochina. Indonesia though is incredibly oil rich. I mean, Shell Oil essentially is this Dutch corporation that's founded from the oil fields in Indonesia. So US cut off the oil and said, we're giving you an ultimatum. You must retreat from Indochina and China back into Manchuria and Korea and we'll make peace with you. But you have to end this war and retreat. Now, this is where Japan flips the story on us and says, the war is the United States fault because you backed us into a corner. You cut off the oil. And this is what some historian critics have said about Roosevelt, that if you just ignored this, he could have concentrated on the real threat with Hitler and, and Germany, but instead he set us on a course with Japan. I'm a little more forgiving to Roosevelt because people forget that Pearl Harbor is the back door to get into Germany. Had it not been for Pearl Harbor, we may not have ever declared war on Germany. But in any case, we cut off the oil basically as a means to put pressure on Japan, which only had about a six months reserve of oil. The war would literally, this is a war of machines. The war would grind to a halt if they didn't find any oil sources. So they felt we've got two choices. We can either go forward or we can go back. Go forward means America's cut off the oil. We didn't want to do this, but they forced our hand. We have to move into Indonesia with our military and literally steal the oil so that we can refine it and run this war. Or we can take the path of humiliation and surrender, which is to withdraw from Indochina, China, and go back into Korea and Manchuria. They were just too proud of people. Their government was way too sold on this war, and they decided we got to go into Indonesia. We don't want to play into the Americans' hands, though. They knew that if they moved into Indonesia, the U.S. would declare war, fortify, be ready, and probably they wouldn't be able to take the Philippines by a direct assault. But what if they knocked out our our reserves, our Navy first and then struck at Indonesia. That was the logic of Pearl Harbor. They knew that two thirds of the distance across the Pacific was most of the American Pacific fleet. 
Now, it was thought to be completely out of range of any kind of Japanese threat whatsoever. I mean, it was insane to think that the Japanese could strike that far. Everybody thought they would strike the Philippines first. But there's this sort of mythology that Japan just attacked us out of nowhere. Tensions had been brewing with them for four years, four and a half years by the time Pearl Harbor happened. It didn't happen out of the clear blue sky. In fact, after the cutting off of oil, the Japanese cut all diplomatic relations with us in November of 1941, in late November, just about two weeks before Pearl Harbor. Everyone was on high alert in the Pacific, but especially the Philippines. In Pearl Harbor, people thought, we're, it was almost like being in California. It was like the Japanese attack here. What are you crazy? We're, we're safe here. Well, they brilliantly planned this raid. Um, they went very far north where the globe is shorter and the distances are shorter. They went all pretty much north to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska and then steamed south from a direction which we did not expect and caught us unawares, basically. On Sunday morning, 7 a.m., uh, Sunday morning, very clever, right? All the Navy guys were probably drinking the night before, uh, Saturday night, and at 7 a.m., they're asleep or hungover or whatever, sleeping on their battleships. And the Japanese struck at that moment and a devastating attack, an attack that humiliated the US. It was the worst military defeat ever in our history. Uh, the one before that was General Custer at, at, um, in Montana at um, the Little Bighorn. This was even worse. 3,000 American sailors were killed in this uh, attack. Hardly any Japanese were killed at all. Uh, it was a sneak attack. They violated the rules of warfare. You are not supposed to attack another nation without warning, without declaring war, and they did. So they're gonna have to live with that, you know, uh, essentially that uh, blame, that, that uh, condemnation for the rest of history, right? Pearl Harbor, you just did a sneak attack. But they thought it was a gamble. They felt war with the US was inevitable. Let's fight on our terms and knock out their Navy at the very first instant of war. And then we can go on a rampage, which they then did. The Japanese just right after Pearl Harbor invaded Indonesia. And then after that, used that as a springboard to invade the Philippines, which was not so heavily fortified and had always thought that they could just rely on Pearl Harbor to reinforce them. There was no fleet at Pearl Harbor anymore, and there would be none for months. And so by February of 42, the Philippines had collapsed. General MacArthur was evacuated. He made it back to the US and he said, I shall return and he would uh, about three years later. And so this was the terrible situation in December of 1941. We, as I said, were caught totally unawares. Um, in Washington, it was several hours uh, later in the day. I believe it was uh, 1 p.m. in the afternoon, 7 a.m. in Pearl Harbor. Uh, it took a long time for, you know, uh, information to really come out to, to get the whole picture. But when it did, Americans were just shocked. How could this happen, right? The Japanese were viewed as this much weaker enemy. How could they wipe out our almost our entire fleet? The silver lining here is that although the U.S. lost key destroyers and battleships, most of our airplanes, cruisers, the weapon of naval warfare, the aircraft carrier, was not impacted by this. The U.S. had four carriers in the Pacific at the time, and all of them were out to sea, very luckily. Now, there have been all kinds of conspiracy theories that these you know, sailors knew, the, the admirals knew the attack was coming, but they had to let it happen to give the U.S. a reason to go. There's no evidence of that. It was probably just kind of clever thinking, like we need to send them out on maneuvers in case there might be an attack. We don't know, but they had no direct knowledge that it was coming. In any case, the aircraft carriers are left undisturbed, and the U.S. would fight just with those carriers for the rest of the war. One of those carriers, the USS Enterprise, for big Star Wars nerds like me, that's you know very exciting because that's where Gene Roddenberry got the name for this. The USS Enterprise would fight every single day of the war and survive. They were at every major battle in the Pacific. They weren't at Pearl Harbor because they were out to sea, but then they would fight at Midway and Guadalcanal and Tarawa and Iwo Jima and Okinawa and then make it back home amazingly. And it's a you know pretty cool starship if you watch Star Trek as well. Um, so that's kind of the saving grace, but it did not look very good. By February of 42, the Japanese had built up this huge imperial fortress, which in terms of square miles was larger than anything the Germans had conquered in World War II. It's a lot of water, but there's hundreds of islands here. 
lots of rice rich areas here, mineral wealth here, and they were not stopping. They were starting to build airfields in Indonesia to launch an invasion of Australia, which the British controlled at the time, and then New Zealand. And there was talk that maybe they might even use some of these islands like Midway as a springboard to attack Hawaii itself, invade it, conquer it, not just raid, fly over for a few hours and leave, but to actually conquer it or maybe even move into Alaska. They were halted right there. That was the furthest extent of their empire. They awoke a sleeping giant in 1941 and they would pay a very heavy price as the US would beat back that invasion. Let's talk about um, Germany and the war in Europe. It is very much forgotten how anti-war the US was in the 30s and even right up until Pearl Harbor. There's a really ugly underbelly in all of this. Um, we forgot a lot of these organizations that had kind of cozy relationships with the fascist movements in the world. Remember, this was before people really understood how awful fascism and the Nazis and, and all of that was. Um, at least Americans were kind of ignorant of it. They, their controlling piece of knowledge was the horrors of World War I. We have to avoid that senseless slaughter again at all costs. And that was the attitude of the French and British too, honestly, which is why they just failed to stand up to Hitler until it was almost too late. The US overwhelmingly is sympathetic to these European nations, Britain and France, but doesn't want to involve itself. In fact, uh, a mythology emerges in the 30s, again, that we got tricked into World War I. The British had faked the Zimmerman telegram uh, that World War I was cooked up by a lot of wealthy bankers. JP Morgan had loaned all this money to the British. The British had to win the war to pay it back. So JP Morgan and the British government cooked up this crazy scheme, the Zimmerman telegram and unrestricted submarine warfare. It was all faked. The Germans become a democratic nation in 1919 and they are totally honest and say, no, dude, we totally did that. Both of those things were unrestricted submarine warfare. Yeah, we did that. Uh, Zimmerman telegram, mm -hmm. yeah, we totally did it. And still Americans, this is the nation of conspiracy theories. And unfortunately it's getting even worse with the internet and all these crazy things you read and see. Conspiracy theories were abound in the 30s. And so the US passed a series of neutrality laws, which made it pretty much impossible to ever get involved in a war. I mean, there was no way any European nation could cross the Atlantic and attack New York. The Monroe Doctrine had become a reality by that point. We had two giant oceans defending us and all these naval bases all around us defending us. But uh, despite that fact, Americans were, were uh, feeling that we had gotten tricked into this war, um, incredibly so. So what are some of the instances of this? Senator Nye of Nebraska founded this commission, which believed that this was a trick, World War I, to get us involved. And so we're going to pass these neutrality acts. You can't trade with any belligerent country. A belligerent country is a country in a state of war. So once a country goes to war, you can't loan them money. You can't sell them weapons. You can't get involved in any way because the idea was that's how we got involved in World War I. We were on the hook. We had loaned so much money to Britain that if Germany had won, Germany would have canceled all those debts. Britain wouldn't have paid us back and we would have had a depression in our country. So how do you stay out of those wars? Don't even loan money. Don't sell weapons. Don't do anything. Don't get yourself involved. It's an interesting idea, but really the lesson of World War II is if you want to prevent a war, you have to stop them when they're really small, when aggressions are minimal. Because if you just sit, try to sit it out, the war will eventually come to you. That's kind of the lesson there. So um, there were organizations like the America First Committee uh, that boasted on having two future presidents. A young John F. Kennedy, born in 1917, had joined the America First Committee at, at Harvard and uh, was very proud to be in this organization, right? The organization was basically saying, and I get this because it was young students, young men who would be forced to go fight this war if it happened. And they were saying, stay out of the war. I get it, right? After I graduated college, the war on terror started the invasion in Iraq. I remember being 24 years old and being very scared that this war would spiral out of control and I would get drafted and go fight in a war that I did not think was worth it to be fighting for the US government. And so if you would put me under that threat, yeah, I'd march in the streets too and say that this is a terrible war and awful, et cetera. 
again, people didn't know that World War II would become the good war. Now, just to clear John F. Kennedy of any wrongdoing, he would eventually join the Navy, become a war hero and fight. But when war broke out, he said, no, we shouldn't be fighting this war at all, at all. Uh, Gerald Ford was another one. He was a very young man in the 1940s, also very much against the war, joined the America First Committee, you know, handed out pamphlets that said all kinds of stuff. You know, this Hitler guy's not really that bad, is he? I mean, there's a lot of uh, exaggeration that the British are saying he's really not this horrible person. Turns out, yeah, he's even worse than you could possibly imagine. But Gerald Ford was a member of that. Again, once the war began and we got into it, Ford would fight in the war and he would be a veteran. But um, he was a member of that, that committee. These committees were all American. This gentleman here was probably the most prominent anti-war person during this time. Um, his name is Charles Lindbergh. Uh, let me tell you his story because I don't think I went over it when I did the 20s, but um, in the 20s, air travel got much, much better. The airplanes invented in, uh, I believe, 1903 in North Carolina, at, at, um, the Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers uh, invented it. And it was used in World War I in the teens and, and they kept getting better, the development. By 1927, uh, airplane manufacturing had gotten so good that you could actually cross an entire ocean with it. Before, it was very crazy. You had to fly from like New York to Newfoundland, Newfoundland to Greenland, Greenland to Iceland, Iceland to Ireland, Ireland to Britain. You had to make like six stops going up around the Arctic. It was very difficult. And so finally, a, an airplane was designed that had a big enough fuel tank to cross the Atlantic in one you know, trip, whatever you want to call it. And so they got this very brave pilot, Charles Lindbergh, who in 1927 flew, took him 27 hours to fly the solo trip. I don't know how he stayed awake. There was no Red Bull or anything like that at the time. Uh, how did he eat? How did he, you know, go to the bathroom? I don't know. But he landed in Paris 27 hours later, and he was in, a huge hero. He was the biggest hero in American history. Uh, some of you might be puzzled and say, greatest hero? I never even heard of the guy. Well, there's Lindbergh Middle School for sure, right? Um, if you guys have ever seen the, the Pixar movie Up, um, the villain in the movie, Charles Muntz, that's basically Charles Lindbergh. Uh, and it's very clever what they did there. Uh, Lindbergh was a German American. And you can tell that by his name. He's got this great Anglo first name, Charles, right? It's a name of several English kings because he's American born here, but he's got this Germanic last name, Lindbergh, right? And so he was very proud to be German American. He was very offended by all the anti-German rhetoric in the First World War, calling them Huns and barbarians. And when World War I was over, he said, my family was shamed so much of being German. We should never let that happen again. So when the Nazis came to power, he was the first one to come out and say, wait, 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 we did all this crazy stuff in World War I. Don't malign the Germans. They're a great nation. Hey, all of you Anglophiles that think Britain is destined to rule the world, Germany's up and coming, baby. You better get ready because Germany is going to be the country of the future. Whether or not Lindbergh knew how bad the fascist parties were in, um, in Germany is unclear, but he used his celebrity all during the 30s to give speech after speech, which has not aged very well. Uh, I mean, really bad. Like in September and October of 1941, this is well after the invasion of the Soviet Union, France and, and Holland and Belgium had been occupied by the Nazis, so had Norway and Denmark. I mean, they really were on the march to conquer the world. They were in the Balkans by that point and, and Serbia and Greece, and they had conquered Crete. And uh, Lindy, as he was known, gave a very awful speech in Madison Square Garden with 20,000 people there, all cheering, saying things like, the Nazis are really not so bad that there's a Jewish conspiracy, a banking conspiracy to enslave the world. And at least the Germans have someone who's man enough to stand up to the Jews. Please don't try to get me in trouble and take this YouTube video out of context. I'm not saying these things. This is Charles Lindbergh saying it. But my point in all of this is to show just unfortunately uh, how normal this all was in 1939, 40 and 41. Half of America basically had these feelings where they said, you know, I don't really care who wins this war. Maybe not half, but big chunks of uh, America, certainly German Americans, 
Um, many people in the South who lived under the Jim Crow system and were white, and they just thought, I don't see what the big deal is about Hitler. He has a lot of the same ideas we do. Um, in fact, when Pearl Harbor happened, a lot of Southern senators and representatives said, how about we just declare war on Japan and leave Germany alone uh, and not fight them at all? Sure, we can aid the British, but our beef isn't with Hitler, it's with uh, Hirohito, right? Americans uh, have forgotten how much this strain, this political strain of sort of cozying up to fascism existed in the US. It all evaporated after Pearl Harbor, of course, but for a long time there, even the labor unions in America, which were very liberal, basically felt this war would just profit the rich, it would destroy unions, it would be this terrible thing. So most sectors of, of the US were against involvement. Some of them from the right who felt that you know Hitler was kind of the good guy in this war, many from the left that just felt we don't want to get used again it's not our fight but nonetheless you know isolationism was strong in america right before world war ii nevertheless our president wanted to get involved as much as he could now he didn't really want to get involved in a direct war but he felt we could be the great arsenal of democracy we could make all these weapons and arm the democracies like britain and france and save the world from this awful ideology fascism Remember, Roosevelt was ethnically Dutch. He was all American, but the Dutch hate the Germans, if you guys are unaware of this. They very much do. This is the bully country that's right next to them that's invaded them dozens of times. They hate them. And Roosevelt felt that Germany was this sort of barbaric society. He absolutely hated them. And he thought that they were uncivilized and evil. And so when the war broke out, he went to Congress and said, can we please sell weapons to the British and French? Which Congress said, all right, what we'll do is in November of 1939, two months into the war, right after Poland had been invaded, Congress finally voted to change the Neutrality Acts. At first, when the war broke out, the law was you cannot sell weapons or loan money at all to a belligerent nation. Now, they said cash and carry. Cash and carry is a policy where we can sell weapons, to the British and the French, but they must, they're not loans, you're going to pay up front, that's the cash part, and you have to pay in gold, because your currency might become worthless in a few years if Germany wins, and carry, meaning you have to haul the stuff across the Atlantic. Why? Because in World War I, our ships were being sunk by the Germans, and that got us in the war, but if we make the weapons in New York and Boston, and you pay us 100% upfront in gold and you ship the weapons, then we're in zero threat of ever getting involved in this war. What's Germany gonna do, blow up New York? They don't have the capacity to do that. But if we're hauling all this stuff, then we're susceptible to getting dragged into the war. It was, many people felt a clever way to keep our neutrality and help the allies. It did almost nothing to help the allies. The British were enraged at this half measure. This is the classic example of basically half-assing something, right? I don't want to actually do the whole job because it's a lot of work. Uh, and, and it might mean that I get my hands dirty, I get involved in this war, so we'll just half-ass it, right? We'll do something that looks on the surface like we're doing something. British and French were enraged. They were cash-strapped. They did not have the gold to buy this up front. Moreover, they didn't have the vessels to move the stuff back and forth. Every single merchant vessel in Britain and France was being converted to go fight the Germans. And plus, this was just a stupid policy. What we needed was stimulus. If the British and French were willing to borrow to spend money here, let them. It'll put our workers back to work. As, as late as March of 1941, the unemployment rate in America was still over 10%. It was about 12% at that time, which is incredibly high still. Even after 12 years of depression, it was still in a pretty bad recession in 1941. As soon as the US started the Lend-Lease Act, just in an instant, all of that ended and full employment went back within 30 days. It was extraordinary. What was Lend-Lease? Well, the cash and carry policy went from November of 39 all the way through 1940 and through the early part of 1941. And it was amazing how long this failure of a policy lasted. Over and over, the Nazis would march into a new country, gain a part of the globe, some horrible blow would be dealt to the British or French and Roosevelt would go back to Congress and say, how about now? Can we overturn this and start loaning money and, and shipping weapons? And over and over the Congress said, no, we're maintaining our neutrality. 
What finally changed the discussion was actually, in retrospect, a kind of minor loss, but at the time, it just seemed awful. France, Holland, Denmark, Norway, they all succumbed in the spring of 1940. In the early spring of 1941, in March, um, the Germans conquered Crete, a little island nation in the Mediterranean, which the British had as a, as a big naval base. The British still controlled key strategic points in the Mediterranean, largely because they controlled India. They dug the Suez Canal to shorten that journey to get cotton and spices and, and all these resources from India through the Suez Canal. So they controlled ports uh, in India, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, in Malta, in Gibraltar, in Crete, uh, all through there, making that journey safe all the way back to Britain. If the Germans conquered Crete, the idea was they would use that as a springboard. They'd control the airfields, they would then conquer Suez, and then everything would be over. Britain would be cut off from India. It's a vital lifeline of resources. There's the whole ball game. The Germans conquered Crete in just a few hours in March of 1941, and they did it amazingly with paratroopers, which you should never be able to do because you planes at the time could not have tanks and armored personnel vehicles or anything like that. It's just men jumping out of an airplane with a machine gun. You may have a lot of them, but they're unarmored. If you have armor on the ground, you know, tanks and everything, you should be able to wipe them out. Crete was not heavily defended. They gained all kinds of intelligence uh, reports that the Germans were coming and still they did nothing to prepare. And Crete fell in a couple of hours. The Germans then had the airfield and they started bringing airplanes to Crete so that they could launch an invasion of Suez and Egypt itself. This sent off huge alarms all throughout Europe and, and, and America too. Churchill was just fit to be tied. He said, if you guys don't get involved today, the war is going to be over and it's, it's not going to look pretty for Europe for the next thousand years, probably another dark ages, most likely. Finally, Roosevelt went back to the Congress and gave this great speech. We need to be the great arsenal of democracy. The countries of Europe don't ask for our soldiers, but they ask for the weapons of war. And he used this great analogy of a neighbor, right? He said, right now, America can see that the neighbor down the street has a house that's on fire and they're asking to borrow our hose so that they can you know, screw it onto their spigot and put out the flames. And when the fire's done, they'll give us the hose back. It's a great analogy and it's a great communicative device, but it makes absolutely no sense in a, in a theater of war, right? What's gonna happen? The British are gonna borrow our uh, aircraft carriers and tankers and planes and after they're blown up, return them? Like a lot of these weapons are gonna get destroyed. How are you gonna return bullets that you fire? It makes no sense. But you know, this is one of these examples where sometimes it's okay to lie to the American people, right? World War II was a noble effort. We had to supply the British, and, and well, at this point, France had surrendered, but we had to supply the British with weapons. And so he used this analogy, barely the Lend-Lease Act passed Congress, just by about three votes in the House of Representatives. There was still a strong feeling of isolationism, but Roosevelt finally got his way. Crete was filmed and shown in movie theaters all over the world and, and you know, little 15 minute film strips before you actually watch the movie and people were horrified. They firmly believe that if we didn't intervene, then that was the last straw. Well, Hitler made a huge mistake in June of 1941 and invaded the Soviet Union, which Churchill was very happy about, and we were very happy about because now we had a new ally, and now we could loan them weapons as well. Lend-lease would be extended to the Russians, and it is extraordinary what the U.S. did for the Soviet Union. Now, we didn't like them very much. It's kind of a coin flip who would win in this struggle. We wanted Britain to win, but the Soviets or the Germans, it's like, geez, those are like two different types of rattlesnakes fighting. We don't like either one. Um, but we decided, hey, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. He's the slightly lesser of two evils, Joseph Stalin is. So let's give him support, but not actual weapons. The Russians focused on just building themselves tanks and an air force and everything else like that. The US built them locomotives. They had a horrible road system, uh, terrible. And so we gave them locomotives, laid railway track, and we gave them over a million of uh, the Ford two and a half ton trucks, which basically is what they used just to go over open fields uh, between Moscow and Berlin. They basically ferried the entire army across with Ford trucks, whereas the Russian or the Germans, which we imagine the Germans are the ex experts of production, Germans were using horses. The Germans used 600,000 horses. 
to haul their artillery pieces and their men back and forth on the Eastern Front. Not very good. And I'll ask you guys, if you had to move an army, would you rather do it with horses or with cars? Horses freeze to death in cold temperatures. You always have to worry about keeping them close to water and food sources. A truck, you just throw gasoline in the tank and you just go on down the road. You can operate in sub-zero temperatures with antifreeze. You may love Buttercup, but Buttercup's gonna die in those sub-zero temperatures. And then there's no more Buttercup to ride into Moscow. Buttercup's my fake name for the horses, right? So um, this was wonderful for the US. We could maintain our neutrality. We're not technically at war. And we could get a victory that we wanted in the war just by supplying the countries that were at war. Huge sums of money poured out of the US Treasury to loan to these two countries. And huge amounts of weapons went to Britain. And huge amounts of non-lethal aid went to the Soviets. Um, one of the things we gave the Soviets was food that the US gave them so much food, it was enough food to feed every last Soviet man, woman, and child for every year, or for every day, excuse me, that they were involved in World War II. This is very good for them, so that the Soviets could pull all their farm boys from the countryside and go throw them at the Wehrmacht in, in Germany and, and, and maximize their forces. And the US just fed them with spam. And that's not some sort of joke or anything. I'm not using spam as a shorthand for food. That's what we gave them. Um, Spam's a, an interesting controversial dish. Uh, it's actually quite funny. In some countries like Korea, it's a delicacy. It's given away at weddings, like with caviar, like in little gift baskets. Uh, in Russia, they love it too. It's kind of considered to be a bit of a delicacy. In America, we're the country that produces the stuff, yet still we turn our nose up at it and say, what is it? Is it meat? I don't know what it is exactly. It's kind of gross. It kept, kept the Russians alive and they loved the stuff. And, and at the siege of Leningrad, when they got these food supplies through in, in the cold winter, they were very grateful to the United States. More lines of railroad and more locomotives were built and brought to the Soviet Union between 1940 and 1945 than any of Stalin's touted five-year plans. If you did your world history last year, Stalin said, we're going to have a five-year plan to improve coal and oil production and railroads nothing like what the U.S. could produce for them. It, it's just a fact that capitalism is more productive than communism, or it's proved to be in practical reality. Maybe theoretically, Marx can make it work on paper, but no country has ever been productive like the U.S. was. And like I said, it ended the depression. This was a win-win. So by the late summer of 1941, the U.S. was feeling much better about its security needs. The, uh, the war was going much better. We had allies now but still we're not directly in the war. Um, the, this did make us an open target for the Germans, the German U-boat fleet. They now have French ports, something they never had during World War I because they conquered France in World War II. And so now they can send out their entire submarine fleet all over the Atlantic. They're sinking all kinds of American merchant vessels. Roosevelt then escorts the vessels or orders the escort of the vessels with like destroyers and cruisers to actually escort these merchant vessels back and forth. A handful of them are sunk. Uh, in September of uh, 1941, the USS Greer is attacked and sunk. Hundreds of American sailors are on board. They're all killed. Roosevelt runs to the Congress, whispers to a few key leaders, hey, the Germans just literally sank an American destroyer. Do you think that I could get a declaration of war? Still, they said no. In October, the USS Reuben St. James was sunk. Same story. Amazingly, Roosevelt still could not get the votes to go to war. Everyone's eyes were on the Atlantic in October and November of 1941, and everybody thought this would eventually go on to the point where the US would have to declare war on Germany. That's not what happened at all. The attack came in the rear. It came in Honolulu, thousands of miles west of where everybody was looking. But this did get us involved in the war with Germany. So this is yet another blunder by Hitler after invading the Soviet Union, probably his biggest blunder. The day after Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt went to the Congress, because that's the way our Constitution works, or supposed to work, is that presidents don't declare war. They go to Congress and ask for a declaration, and Congress declares war. So he did that, and he got a declaration of war on Japan. Now, for a day there, he said, why don't we get like a twofer, right? Like, well declare war on Japan and Germany. Didn't have the votes for Germany. Even at that point after Pearl Harbor, even though an ally of Germany literally attacked a base of ours and destroyed a huge part of our fleet and killed 3,000 sailors, still 
Roosevelt didn't have the, the votes for Germany. So he said, all right, we'll declare war on Japan and we'll just, maybe we'll just aid Britain and the Soviet Union. Maybe we'll get involved sooner or later. Who knows? We'll see what happens. Three days later, Hitler did the biggest favor to FDR. Hitler gave a speech to the Reichstag and he said, we are declaring war on America, which made no sense. It did absolutely nothing to enhance his strategic position. It's like, well, what would that allow you to do that you're not already doing? Already the German submarine fleet is sinking American ships. Hitler could not just reach across the Atlantic and bomb New York or anything. Uh, so why would he do that when all it did was it allowed Roosevelt to say, oh, now I don't need a declaration of war because a war exists. We have been declared war upon. So I, as commander in chief, can just go use the military to go fight Germany. And he did. Roosevelt understood very wisely that the big threat here was Ger Germany. If Germany had knocked out the Soviet Union or Great Britain from this war, it would have been all over. They were clearly the bigger threat to human civilization. Japan could wait. It was the weaker of the two. It was running wild now because no one was fighting. China was the only country holding out against Japan and they weren't doing very well. Um, and so Roosevelt took massive resources that could have gone to go fight Japan and used them to go fight against Germany. Two thirds of the weapons that were produced in the first two years of the war went to go fight against Germany. So why, why did Hitler do that? It's still a bit of a mystery. Apparently he really hated the United States. He just did not respect us or like, like us very much. He just wanted to annoy us. Amazingly, three other countries were allied to the Axis. A lot, a lot of people don't know this, but it wasn't just Germany, Italy, and Japan. Those are the big three. But there were three other small countries that were fascist and allied with Germany and, and Italy. Bulgaria, Hungary, and Romania. I think you guys see why we just ignore them because it's like, who cares, right? Those three countries also declared war on the US. Even though they're deep in Eastern Europe, they would never be able to fire a single shot against American soldiers during World War II. They fought against the Soviets, basically, and that was it. And yet they declared war on the United States too. The US was so determined to stay out of this war that the Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, was sent to Ankara, which is in Turkey, one of the countries that was neutral in World War II, and talked to those three ambassadors, the Bulgarian, the Hungarian, and the Romanian ambassadors, and asked them politely, would you please rescind your declaration of war? Because we'd rather not go to war with you. There's not much point. Would you please rescind that? And they refused. So you see these really two sides. The fascist countries were so over eager to go to war, the democracies like Britain, France, and especially the United States, we bent over backwards to stay out of this conflict and we basically got dragged in. Hitler dragged us into the conflict by doing it, right? He literally invaded the Soviet Union and then declared war on the US. That would be like me walking into a bar uh, and picking a fight with The Rock and Vin Diesel at the same time. I just got myself involved in a Fast and Furious movie. I would never do that. I'm a small person. That would be insane. This is what Germany did because Hitler was pretty crazy. Um, in any case, we are now at war with both. Now, going into 1942, it, um, it was going to take a while uh, before the U.S. could be fully mobilized. It took a year and a half. It took from December of 41 to July of 43 until the U.S. was fully mobilized. Now, it when we were still at peace, Roosevelt was smart enough to have a peacetime draft. When the war broke out in 1939 and the U.S. wasn't involved, our military was about 200,000, very small. We were the 17th largest army in the world behind Sweden. Behind Sweden. Sweden was neutral in World War II and we had a smaller army than the Swedes. We did have a pretty sizable navy, about third or fourth in the world behind the British, the Germans, and the French. But it could easily be beefed up, and it would. By the time the war ended, we had the largest Air Force and Navy in the world, not the largest army, the Soviets would have that at the end, but we had to beef up our army. In 1940, a draft was implemented and the standing army was raised to a million, but the Germans had over 10 million in their army. And so we were gonna have to crank this up quite a bit. By the end of World War II, the US had 16.4 million people in uniform. So after Pearl Harbor, we had to beef up the army by 16 fold. It was not an easy task to do. We would have to draft millions of men. The lie I was told when I was young was that the day after Pearl Harbor, every man in the country joined the army. It's not true, not by a long shot. Now, 5 million men did join between 
Pearl Harbor and VJ Day over the four years there, but two thirds of those 11 million were drafted and just axiomatically didn't want to fight. If you wanted to fight, you could have volunteered, but you know, you didn't. So we're going to have to draft 11 million men. They're going to have to be health screened they're going to have to be trained. They're going to have to have supplies. We're going to have to build up planes and tanks and, and you name it, everything. We're going to have to produce food like we've never produced food. There was a revolution in food production at the time called the Green Revolution. Basically, uh, chemical companies like Dow Chemical figured out that if you used petrochemicals, basically animal waste treated with gasoline, it's a little more complicated than that, but basically that's what it is. If you lay that down on a field, you don't have to rotate your crops. You can grow on every inch of your soil pretty much in any conditions. I saw this one crazy demo where a guy showed that you could actually uh, grow grass on concrete because there's chemicals are so good these days. If you throw down these kind of, you know, uh, chemical fertilizers, you can grow stuff anywhere in deserts and really harsh conditions. And so the US was able to just produce huge sums of food at that time. This became a, a huge economic engine of growth. I'll tell you a little story about my grandma that I mentioned at the beginning of lecture. My grandmother, God rest her soul, Mary Hoggett, she was born in Oma, Mississippi in 1923. I've been to Oma, Mississippi. It's a sad place. When she was 12, her father died in 1935. So it was just her mother, her brother, and her sister. That was it. Now they were actually pretty lucky. They had, you know, a home, a small little, you know, farm out back, not very big, but four or five acres. They had some chickens. They had a pig. They'd kill a pig once a year and eat for a couple of weeks off of it. The rest of the time they ate eggs and corn and stuff like that. And nothing was going on. She graduated in May of 1941 from high school, got her diploma, and started working as a secretary right after that. But there was just nothing going on in Oma, Mississippi. Pearl ha Harbor happened in December. A few months later, in the spring of 1942, uh, a what, what they called at the time an industrial agent visited her hometown. He was from Douglas Aircraft. This is what the government did. They just paid to send these agents off all over to recruit people. And so my grandma and her girlfriends, you know, just 19 years old, said, let's go listen to what he has to say. So they went and heard this speech. And the guy, you know, showed all these, you know, cool posters of Santa Monica, California, and the airplane factories and everything and said, come on out to Santa Monica, city of the future. LA is beautiful. They get 330 days of sunshine throughout the year. Almost no rain. It never snows. It's beautiful. Housing is still cheap. Come on out there. And I have to respect my grandma for this. I don't know if I would have had the guts at 19 without a college education to do this, but she went the next day. She and her girlfriend met a young couple who were there and they said, we're leaving tomorrow at 6 a.m. Would you like to hitch a ride with us? You just pay us a couple of bucks and we'll, we'll drive you out there with us. And so they just started the road trip, packed a suitcase, went to LA and just never went back. And Every time I tell that story, I am so grateful to my grandma that she didn't stay in Mississippi because then I would have been born in Mississippi. And if you know about Mississippi, my life would have been very different and probably not, not much better. I'm so grateful I was born in California. So thank you, Granny. That was very nice of you. She moved out to Santa Monica and as a single woman at 19 was making enough money to support herself. She got into the union and she was laying cable basically. So she worked in the airplane factory and so the steering wheel is attached to a cable that pulls the tail fin. And so that's what she would do. She would come in and hook up the cable to the steering wheel and then lay it throughout, you know, the interior of the plane to the tail and make sure it was all sealed up when the welders and riveters came by. And she made a fortune. Um, not literally, but coming out of the Great Depression, it seemed like a fortune for her. She wasn't married yet. She was just saving money. Um, there wasn't much you could spend your money on. Automo automobile production just ground to a halt. There were no cars produced at all between 1942 and 1945. There was very little home construction. When you moved out to LA, they didn't have enough homes for everybody. You would just go and look in neighborhoods and there would be little signs in the windows that said room for rent. And you would just live with a family and rent a bedroom or maybe share half of a bedroom with someone. That's what a lot of people did. Um, and multiply my granny's story by about 10 or 15 million and you've got what was going on in America. People were uprooted from their poor rural communities and moved to big neighborhoods like LA, Santa Monica, Long Beach blew up real big at this time, Seattle did, Detroit did very much, that was the center of airplane production. 
Um, New York grew even more during World War II. New Orleans was a big center of production of the landing craft, which you see at the beginning of um, Saving Private Ryan. Mobile Bay, Alabama, all of these were giant magnets for interior migration. People moved and worked at factories and worked 24 seven and made a lot of money. Okay, I think I'm running out of time here. I'm gonna go ahead and stop. And when we pick up our story next time, we'll talk about how the home front was changed and then how the actual war was prosecuted. Um, and we'll learn about all that good stuff. Okay, so I will begin here with Miss Rosie the Riveter next time. Good to be with you guys. Um, have a good uh, weekend, okay? See you next time.